Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we're going to give another minute or so for more participants to join, and then we will go ahead and get started. Good morning to everyone who is just joining. Uh, we'll just give another 20 seconds or so, and then we will begin the webinar. Thank you for coming today. All right, so I think we can go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to today's webinar, which is hosted by Hepatitis Delta Connect. My name is Beatrice Sovich. I am a public health program manager at the Hepatitis C Foundation and the manager of Hepatitis Delta Connect. Thank you all for joining today. For today's webinar, we are focusing on the scientific journey of bulevertide, which is the first drug in the world that has been approved for the treatment of Hepatitis Delta. We will have an opportunity today to hear from the famous researcher who has made this incredible discovery and brought this drug forward to a place where it can significantly help those who are living with hepatitis delta virus. Dr. Oroban will share insights about his experience and the research process, as well as the science behind how bulevertide, also known as Hepcludex, works. We are very much looking forward to hearing his presentation. And next slide, please. Thank you. So before we get started, I would like to remind all participants that during today's webinar, all audience members are muted. We encourage you to use the chat feature to let us know who you are and where you are joining from. If you have any technical challenges, please indicate your issue using the chat box and we will address it as soon as possible. At any time during the presentation, you can answer questions into the Q&A box. Questions will be addressed by Dr. Urban at the conclusion of the presentation. And this session is also being recorded and slide presentations will be shared following the webinar. Next slide, please. Thank you. So just a quick background about Hepatitis Delta Connect. Um, Hep Delta Connect is a dedicated program of the Hepatitis B Foundation, and it was established in 2016 for the explicit purpose of raising awareness about Hepatitis Delta and promoting diagnosis, screening, research, and linkage to care, as well as providing support for those living with and affected by Hepatitis Delta through a variety of channels, including email and phone consults, social media, newsletters, blog posts, a website, and webinars such as this one. We are hoping to continue to build and expand our programming throughout 2023, and we will keep you posted about these developments and further opportunities to get involved. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we are thrilled and honored to be joined today by Dr. Stefan Orban, who is a world-renowned scientist, and he will share some of his achievements, some of the achievements of his remarkable career with us today. Dr. Orban is head of the Translational Virology Unit at the Department of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Virology at Heidelberg University Hospital. Professor Urban and his team developed the first drug for hepatitis delta at the Heidelberg University Hospital. And the drug which works to block the entry of the hepatitis B and D virus into the liver cell was approved by the European Commission in July of 2020. Dr. Urban is the recipient of numerous awards and recognitions. His research interests include molecular mechanisms of hepatitis B and delta virus and host interactions with a focus on the early and late events of viral infection as well as development of novel cell culture systems and animal models for hepatitis B and Delta, 
clinical development of entry inhibitors for hepatitis C and Delta infection and development of drugs for the therapy of liver diseases. So we're very excited to hear from Dr. Urban today and are grateful to him for joining us. And without further ado, um, I will hand it over to Professor Urban. Um, and thank you so much. Um, and just a note, as a reminder, we will first hear the presentation and then we'll open it up for questions and answers at the end. So please feel free to put any questions you have into the Q&A box as they come up. Um, and thank you very much. Fiona, okay. you can... Thank you very much, Beatrice, for that kind introduction. I am trying to share my slides. First of all, hello to everybody uh, online. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to you a little bit on the uh, background of the development of uh, the boulevard height. Try to share my slides first. Okay. So as Beatrice already mentioned, um, we have done for two and a half decades almost work on the entry of hepatitis viruses. And um, the history of that development of boulevardite, and I will show you some scientific and some historical events that led us to this development and at the end, some clinical uh, updates that, that we have. Um, this was not a journey that uh, was intended to develop a drug. It was a journey that, that started purely scientifically in understanding how this amazing group of viruses, the hepatitis B virus initially, and later on the hepatitis Delta virus, can infect hepatocytes and can choose its host. Before I start, I would give uh, some uh, uh, disclosures. So I am consulting several companies as a scientist, and I'm a patent holder and inventor on the patents that protects the boulevardite. And the clinical studies I will refer to have been financed from sometimes from industry and, uh, and, and to some part from the German Cancer for Infectious Diseases. Now, let's start off with something that you probably all are aware of. These are hepatitis B virus infection. Although we have a vaccine, there are 240 million people still chronically infected. About 650,000 of them die each year to HPV-related liver diseases that is progressing uh, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. And we have areas of high endemicity, Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, in those countries, the transmission of the virus during birth from mother to child is a very important point, and therefore vaccination at a very early time point is, uh, uh, is mandatory. And also maybe in combination with, as you may know, with antibodies, passive vaccination, which is actually entry inhibition to prevent the spread of the virus from one to another host. There is another virus that was discovered by Mario Rissetto, um, and that's the hepatitis delta virus that was initially thought to be, it was immediately associated with HPV, but initially it was thought it's another antigen that uh, Mario discovered here, the delta antigen. But finally it came out that this is a virus that depends on the hepatitis B virus because it requires gene products, namely the envelope protein of the hepatitis B virus. I'll come to that in a moment and explain it more in detail. So we have areas of high endemicity like Africa or Mongolia, Turkey, Russia, Pacific Islands, but we have very poor data on the epidemiological, uh, uh, on good epidemiological data. So it's probably also underdiagnosed even in developed countries. And we think that there are at least 12 million people co-infected uh, maybe even more, up to 25 million. And this is the most severe form of hepatitis. Progression uh, of the liver disease is faster. Now we have to do something against that. As you know, the treatment options that we have for hepatitis B are mostly nucleoside analogs. In the early times, lamivudine. Now we take entecavir and virid, tenofovir, or even a variant, the TAF. And they can suppress the viral load and they are very effective in normalizing ALT levels, but they have to be given infinitely because uh, we can not get high rates of uh, HBS antigen loss, so very low rates of cure. And um, more importantly, they have no effect on Delta virus because they do not directly affect the helper function that the Delta needs from B namely the S antigen, the surface proteins. We have a second group, which are the interferons. The interferons have a still low rate of S antigen 
loss, but still higher than the nucleoside analogs. And they have some positive effects on patients, but they have severe side effects. And they had limited effects on Delta in some eligible patients. Some of them have already progressive liver disease and cannot be treated anymore. But nevertheless, we have long-term relapses. So they are even not approved for Delta treatment. So the currently approved therapeutic regimens for HPV are not curative. There is no specific treatment for Delta available until recently in Europe when bulimatide was approved. And the medical need to improve HPV therapy is quite high because we wanted to have finit therapies and curative therapies, but we have a high need to develop effective Delta therapies because there's nothing at the moment that can be given to the patients for the most severe form. Now, let me come back to the dependence of these viruses on each other. The B virus depicted here on the left has an, is an envelope virus that has a capsid and a DNA inside the capsid. And these, caps, uh, and these uh, envelope proteins, as I already mentioned, are used by the delta. So the delta in a co-infected cell steals the envelope protein or snatches the envelope protein from the B virus and packages an RNA genome that replicates by a completely different pathway. I can't go into details of this replication, but that is the cause that something that interferes with the replication of B will not interfere with the replication of D, but something that interferes, for example, with uh, envelope mediated entry of the virus into a parasite can interfere with uh, hepatitis B and D. For a long time, it has, been very un it has been unclear how this virus manages to specifically infect the respective host, which is human in the case of human hepatitis B virus, but there are other hepatna viruses around in the, uh, in, in, in the animal kingdom, in the woodchuck, in the ducks, I come to that later on. But um, it took quite a while until we understood where these infectivity determinants within the three envelope proteins that you see here, the L, the M and the S proteins are located. We know that attachment of the virus is some, has something to do here with the antigenic loop of the envelope proteins and that the specific receptor recognition uh, is here located in the N-terminal part of the so-called pre-S1 domain of the large hepatitis B virus surface protein, which in the virus is buried in the membrane. So these determinants here are very important for the virus to enter the hepatocyte and to, to target its host. I mentioned that both viruses replicate completely differently in the respective, uh, uh, in the hepatocyte, but they take the same entry pathway because they have the same envelope protein. That's actually what we are targeting, but they have other common features. And that's important for maybe curative um, treatment in the future. And that is that they persist in the hepatocyte of an infected patient as circular episomes in the nucleus of the liver cell. So in case of HPV, it's a CCC DNA that is established. Um, and in the case of HDV, it's a circular single-stranded RNA. The formation of these episomes can be efficiently blocked by haplodex or bulimatide. That means that we can have an effect therapeutically once we prevent the novo infection, once we remove, and that's the important second part, the genetic elements that are in the nucleus of the cell. So in general, the virus enters the space of this A, there's a kind of size uh, uh, limitation in the fenestrated endothelium, that's the parasite here. And then it binds to heparin sulfate proteoglycans, that's prerequisite. For binding, I just mentioned that, that's important because we can interfere here with these immunoglobulins in this very first attachment steps that, is, that are used also as a passive vaccination. And then we think there's an envelope rearrangement of this envelope of the virus at the main membrane of the hepatocyte to release the receptor binding site. And that is very special for hep hepatitis B virus, a Delta virus here at the surface of the cell. And we are in investigating that. And we know that this specific interaction, we know that since 2012, um, is mediated by the sodium taurocholate co-transporting polypeptide. That's a bile acid transporter that's functional and specifically expressed at the hepatocyte surface 
uh, in, uh, in the liver. And therefore, uh, this interaction probably determines the tropism of the virus to the liver and also the host specificity of that virus because we were lacking animal models for a long time that allows us to study the virus and we are lacking cell culture systems. Now, what is our approach? I just brought it into that simple scheme. If we go to that large envelope protein, we can regard that as a key, a key that has to open up the, the, the lock that is on the hepatocyte. And what we've done actually is we synthesize the key bit and we use the key bit to block the lock. And that's actually what I will talk about because bulevertide, or as we formally called it, Merclodex, is the old name that was the one, one of the first uh, vials that we had um, for clinical studies. Um, we synthesized that peptide, it's quite a complicated molecule as you can see here, uh, in order to block the lock, the receptor on the surface, and we, uh, we, we developed that therapeutically. Now that's the concept, and I wanna give you some historical insights. We did not start with uh, the human hepatitis B virus. We started with a model system that was available at the time around, uh, around 96 when I entered as a postdoc in Heinz Schaller's lab. Heinz Schaller was a pioneer in the molecular biology and also a pioneer together with my former PhD father, Peter Hans Hofschneider, uh, uh, in the hepatitis B virus research. And this is a picture I just wanted to show you where uh, we worked together in the 90s. That was me when I was young here, by the way. Some of you may know Ulla Brotzer. This was Heinz. There are other people that are still in the HPV field. And we started off with trying to find the receptor of that virus. We wanted to, uh, we, we had the idea that if we identify the receptor of the duck hepatitis B virus, then we can find and we also identify the receptor of the human hepatitis B virus. So we had a flock of ducks in a village, which we had to select first because many of these Peking ducks have been endogenously already infected with duck hepatitis B virus. And we usually, um, uh, prepared primary duck hepatocytes from that uh, from the ducklings, and we infected those primary hepatocytes with the duck hepatitis B virus. And we ask ourselves if we take empty particles, for example, or if we take the protein that we recombinantly produced or the peptide that we produced um, from derived from that large envelope protein, uh, whether they can compete with infection. And what we found at that time is, yes, we have a species specific effect of peptides that have been derived from the duck hepatitis B virus L protein. You see here uh, the interference with the infection at different concentrations, but this was species specific. The human pre so that's the precursor of the Merclodex does not do anything in the duck hepatitis B virus system. And that could be investigated. And we did that very carefully and we, uh, aimed to identify the DHBV receptor in order to get the human hepatitis B virus receptor. And that's just a summary a little bit historically what I did during my um, habilitation in, uh, in, in Heidelberg. So we characterized this receptor, which was a molecule called carboxypeptide SD as an essential receptor for all these avian hepatna viruses. We could uh, show that they interfere with infection. We could even produce some soluble receptor. Here, for example, you see the, the, the duck hepatitis B virus and these dark dots here are immuno uh, gold labeling of the large envelope protein at the surface of these viruses. And if you put the receptor in the soluble form of that receptor, you can see that they all go to one side of that particle. So the receptor obviously changes in the membrane something and localizes this receptor complex uh, at one side of the virus in order to enter this virus later on. And uh, we also had then investigated, this again is this large envelope protein from the duct, whether these peptides that I already mentioned, so the, that they block the key, whether they are also active and we find here a similar thing. So we, then looked whether the HPV receptor is carboxypeptide ST, and I don't want to go too much into detail. It was not identified as carboxypeptide ST, it was something different. But we had that concept of entry inhibition uh, by envelope protein derived peptides. And that brought us to the idea 
to test that in humans. And um, the problem was that we didn't have um, the infection systems. So the only infection system that was around were primary human hepatocytes. And these hepatocytes were um, occasionally obtained from patients that get a partial liver resection, and we could use them here. You see some seeded one. And we could infect these, virus, uh, these hepatocytes, these primary human hepatocytes with hepatitis B virus. In green, you see here the S antigen in infected cells. So you see almost all cells could be infected. We have here also a bile canaliculi. They are in red and the blue are the nuclei. So this is uh, uh, infected primary human hepatocyte cell culture that you occasionally could get, but that could, couldn't allow us to screen for drugs. But in 2002, there was a, a, an additional very important discovery by Philippe Crepon in, in Rennes, and that was the first cell line that we can use, the hepa RG cells, that can be differentiated. So you can put them into a plate and then you can uh, add some goodies. And after about 20 uh, days, you have them in the shape of primary hepatocytes and you can infect them at least with a limited susceptibility in a subpopulation of cells with hepatitis B virus. And that was a, I would say a breakthrough in uh, uh, development of hepatitis B virus research. Here you see the core antigen stain. And this is Philippe Crepon in 2005, when we organized in Heidelberg, a hepatitis B virus international meeting, and we presented some data also here. And with that in hands, we could now look whether those peptides that we produced as a control for the duct hepatitis B virus infection are, in fact, uh, uh, are inhibitory for HPV. And this is indeed the case. And we were very surprised about the activity. This here, picomolar concentration, you can see that infection inhibition can already be achieved at very low concentration with IC50s at so about 80 picomolar. And um, here you see a, a, a raising concentration of these peptides. And we could also verify the concept that this works with hepatitis delta uh, as well as expected because they have the same envelope. And here again, I show you that this also works in the primary human hepatocyte. This is the picture of a non-competed infection without the peptide. Here we have bulevertide. And with bulevertide pre-incubation, we can completely block the infection of that virus at very low concentrations in the, in the, uh, in the nanomolar range and 50% inhibition already at 80 picomolar. So this is important for the efficacy later on, the clinical efficacy of that drug in uh, uh, that we completely block with high efficacy the uh, receptor of that virus. And then we decided, yes, we want to go for that uh, peptidic complicated drug in order to um, uh, to develop it as a, uh, as a molecule that can be used in patients. And here I show you, for example, one, uh, 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 one experiment that we did in mice where we used the peptide, labeled it with a radioactive dye, injected it, and as you can see, within very short time, it goes to the liver of infected mice, and it stays there for one hour, six hours, 24 hours. So obviously the pharmacokinetics, as we say, is very favorable because it selectively goes to the, to the organ that, it, uh, that, that we want to, 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 to target, and it even stays there for a day. And the big question, of course, at that time, and you should all remember, that was at a time when we did not have the receptor, was the question which molecule is interested. And into play comes here when Hui Li, and I really, uh, this was another big milestone in the development, um, when he published, and he's a Bloomberg Prize winner uh, uh, here, the sodium taurocholate co-transporting polypeptide, the bile acid transporter, is the key receptor for these peptides. And this is just, uh, this has been verified by us, and this just summarizes what that molecule does. So this is the integral transmembrane protein that is targeted by the L protein of the virus. It normally transports bile acids, bile salts from blood into hepatocytes, and it is the target for the bulevertide. And interestingly, also the bulevertide once bound to that receptor, and I just mentioned here, or I show a little bit that the binding, we think, occurs even within 
the membrane. So it's a very, very, very uh, delicate, let's say, interaction between the uh, ligand and the receptor. But it can also block the bile acid transport, but it blocks transport at a little bit higher concentration or a little bit hundredfold higher concentration than it blocks the infection inhibition. So Boulevard tried treatment, and that's of course important. Once the receptor was found, we had a kind of idea what could be the side effects if we treat uh, uh, patients with that uh, uh, with a drug. The Boulevard tried treatment; it uses elevated bile salt levels at very high doses or at high doses. And possible side effects might be related to the impairment of the bile acid transport, uh, and also the transport of other substrates of this NTCP. And that, of course, has been very carefully looked at during the clinical development of that um, study. And I show you now the historical thing before I come to the clinical part. Uh, so about 2001, we have done all these kind of mapping. And I already mentioned it maybe that we had produced hundreds of peptides in order to get the best candidate for uh, for the inhibition, and then we did, and I didn't mention that also, investigations in uh, in mice, where we could find that we completely prevent infection. We did the activity studies, the binding studies, the pharmacokinetic studies, toxicological studies, and then in 2009 we had the first clinically produced vials, so vials uh, of the GMP that can be used in clinical trials. And in 2011, the 27th, of course, I remember the date very well, the 27th of July in 2011, the first uh, healthy volunteer was dosed. And we had then finally um, a first publication on first in man application of that novel drug in uh, the Journal of Hepatology. And uh, even at very high doses, we did not see any kind of uh, signals that point to, uh, uh, to, to toxicity in the way that it would lead to the end of the development. And that, of course, was a milestone for us, but it still did not show you clinical data or clinical efficacy in patients, because for that, we need to show or we need to investigate if an entry inhibition at all would have a clinical benefit for a uh, chronically infected patients, of course, a patient, of course, we already mentioned that we could probably prevent the transmission of the virus, for example, after liver transplantation of someone who was HPV infected, infected or from, a, uh, from mother to child transmission or, uh, or any other thing. But how can we imagine that the mode of action of an anti-inhibitor would have a positive effect on a chronic persistent HPV, HDV infection. Therefore, let's look again at this scheme that I showed you already. So I told you that both the HPV and the HDV established circular episomes, CCC DNA or circular RNA in the nucleus. And to maintain these reservoirs, we thought or we think that we have a dynamic replenishment of these episomes by either an intracellular route where we have, as we call that the amplification of CCC DNA or the amplification or the new replenishment of the circular RNA that's then packaged and gone out, or we have maybe something that requires the extracellular roots. It means that the virus has to go out and enter again either the same cell or another cell um, by the virus. And the question is just about the dynamics of a turnover of hepatocytes uh, and a turnover of these uh, uh, internuclear uh, genomes and uh, whether we can, by entry inhibition, um, contribute to the clearance of those episomes in chronically infected patients. And to answer such a, such a question, it would be important to have a clinical trial. And we started then with a lot of help of companies and other uh, help uh, clinical trials, first pivotal trials that I want to report on. But then we had a big clinical trial, the MUR202 trial, that has been recently published in Lancet Infectious Diseases. So it took quite a while because everything uh, uh, went through and all the data came out. And if you want to, you can, of course, read all the, uh, all the stuff in that publication. But I just want to summarize how that trial was designed. And it should give us a hint on whether such a dynamics works in HPV, HDV co-infected patients. So it was a... At that time, the largest Delta trial, 120 patients in four arms, so each arm we had 30 patients, they um, received uh, tenofovir in order to control the HPV um, 
the HB replication of patients. And then for half a year, they received two, five, or 10 milligram Merclodex or Ulivertide, at that time we called the Merclodex, uh, which they self administer subcutaneously. And then there was another half a year of follow up and one control arm, which was just treated by NUX. And what, we've, what we observed here, and this is the mean values of 30 patients, every curve that you see is the mean of 30 patients. You can see in fast and dose independent normalization of ALT levels in all three arms that received the drug and not in the arm that received the control, which was the bulivertide or kept the bulivertide. So ALT normalization under treatment within 24 weeks. But then the increase of ALT levels after the drug was removed again, um, indicating that we have not cured those patients, but we had done some benefit to them regarding at least the biochemical uh, responses. These are the virological responses. So serum RNA levels that are reduced in all three arms that received Mercodex as well. Um, with a maximum reduction in that trial of about 2.7 log, which is 500 fold reduction of the serum RNA at week 24 with a drug that does not have an effect on an ongoing replication, just only has an effect on the de novo infection. And that led us, of course, to the uh, speculation that there may be um, a rapid turnover in the range of weeks and not months of HDV infected hepatocytes. So the concept would be that although it takes long, we remove infected cells during treatment. Just show you here um, the same curve that I showed you before, the 10 milligram curve, but here the individual patients, you see that almost every patient reacted, responded to bulivertide. And interestingly, these patients respond differently. So some have a very traumatic effect uh, within a short time period, and the, the, some are more moderate. And we don't understand more from a molecular basis yet why that is. We are working on that in order to understand why patients react differently. There were no breakthrough under therapy in the 10 milligram arm and no resistance. We have also done now in the further studies, just to mention that that may be published soon, uh, no resistance which we also, of course, would not expect because we target the receptor and that should be genetically differently. And, uh, but that's not the case. And we have the tendency to rebound to initial levels and we can speculate why that is. Is there a memory of replication space? These are specific scientific questions that we are currently addressing to understand that. But we had the um, agreement of some of these patients uh, they were ready to spend biopsy material at the beginning and at the end of treatment. And this is one patient, about 007, but I want to show you that. This was done by Lena Alweis and in Maura Dandri's lab. So here you can see a, 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 a biopsy of a liver and here the enlargement and you see in brownish the um, hepatitis B virus, delta virus infected cells that spread around the liver. Uh, before we start the treatment. And after treatment of 24 weeks, the liver looks like that. That was a second paired biopsy. And as you can see, the concept of losing infected hepatocytes has been verified by this, uh, by, by this investigation, which is very important. Um, and we also did, or Lena also did uh, intrahepatic HDV RNA levels, intrahepatic, that means that we lose the RNA in the liver, which is of course the most important thing, not to lose only the RNA in the serum, uh, but to lose the RNA in the liver um, is here uh, shown by 1.3 log reduction in the 10 milligram arm. So that would also mean that we may have a curative potential of bulivertide if we treat longer. And how long do you have to treat? That is something we then uh, were embarking to calculate. And if you look at individual patients and these different declines in uh, the different patients, you see that they almost follow a so-called zero order kinetics. So it doesn't matter how, how long you treat, uh, it goes down and the, 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 the reduction of serum RNA um, continues to decrease and we did some calculation on the basis of a mathematical model how long would it take until we have maybe starting from 10 to the 5 
uh, viruses per mil, how long would it take to have less than one virus within 10 liters of blood? And um, with the data that we had in, the, in, 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 in this trial, we saw that about three years treatment would lead to about 87% of patients having no virus anymore. But that's of course a calculation and has to be investigated. And it's exactly what will be done now and what is the, the, the current phase three running study design. And that is uh, three arms, one arm starting with a, uh, with a let's say, a treatment, uh, no treatment, though it's a kind of delayed treatment. And then we have two years, 10 milligram, or we have three years, two milligram, or we have three years, 10 milligram. And then we make follow up of two years in order to see whether there is a, a rebound or not within a relatively long observation periods. And there are uh, interims results already reported at uh, week 48. And uh, yes, 50% of patients achieve more than two log decline within four, 24 weeks. And that this elimination is expected in two to three years, we will see. Now, at that, I want to stop. There is much more to tell. I give you a short summary later on, on where you can find that. But let me sum up here where we stand now. So Bulevertide, or formerly Merkludex, Hepcludex, was approved under the trade name Hepcludex in the EU in August 4th in 2020, what Beatrice already mentioned. Then Mir Pharmaceuticals, which is a small company that we were working with, and I was never an uh, uh, active uh, participant in that company, we also had contracts with that company, has been acquired by Gilead in December 10th, 2020, on the basis of these clinical results that I just demonstrated to you and on the increasing awareness for uh, treatment of the Delta. Then Gilead submitted a, a BLA for bulivertide in November 22nd, and, uh, 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 21. And the FDA approval is, as you know, pending. There has been a uh, a response letter by the FDA, and uh, there is uh, some improvement to do, and we hope that the FDA and the additional data that will be provided will help to approve that viral, the, that drug also uh, relatively quick in the US to come to the patients. I promised you already to give an outlook, outlook in, this, in, the, in the way, where are we standing now with real world studies? This is a summary of the uh, abstracts that have been presented at the ESL 2022 in London, at the AASLD in 2022 in Washington. And um, this is just a, a kind of summary. You can then look that up. Uh, these are the numbers. I just want to mention some there is, for example, investigations now going on from uh, real world data that the bulivertide is broadly active against all HDV genotypes that express the envelope proteins, that's by the way was uh, as it was designed. Uh, I already mentioned that we had no detectable resistance of bulivertide in participants with uh, chronic hepatitis uh, B virus through 48 weeks. So there are other ways of explaining why some few patients do not respond as efficient or even some do not respond at all to bulivertide. We have to find other explanations. It's not resistance. Then um, the uh, approval for the bulivertide so far in Europe is in uh, uh, non-advanced cirrhosis, and there has been some trials now done also in advanced cirrhosis patients, and that has obviously also benefits to those patients that are in deepest need of uh, treatment. And uh, there has even one case report now that uh, uh, um, one patient that received bulivertide in a compassionate use program for more than three years and has stopped, has not got a rebound uh, uh, of HDV RNA. I would like to, uh, to direct you to a very nice review that recently came out by the Petio Lombertico Group Journal of Virology uh, Hepatitis in 2023. Look at that, then you can be summarized all real world data and all clinical uh, data so far. And with that, I would like to thank all the people and I, First of all, thank, of course, the patients and the clinicians that have been participating in that clinical studies. It was, of course, very, very important to see that it works. But I also want to thank all the people from my lab uh, over the years that helped me to develop uh, that drug and the cooperator, Ralf Bartenschlager's co-worker in the molecular virology, 
Alexander Alexandrov von the Mühe GmbH and Pavel from the Moscow Research Clinical Center, Heiner Wedemeyer and the Competence Net Hepatitis, the people from the clinical pharmacology, co-operators, Maura Dandri, Valsamir, and all the funding that we have, because all the preclinical work and even the early clinical work was really funded by uh, ministry uh, funding agencies. And without that, uh, we wouldn't have come to that point. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope it was a little bit comprehensive for you, not going too much into detail, but telling you a little bit the concept of that. And I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Urban. It was such a rich and insightful and comprehensive presentation. So we really appreciate it. Um, and I think it sheds a lot of light as well on the what the clinical trial process involves on the scientific journey. This has clearly been decades in the making. So I think it's helpful to understand really how long um, a drug can take to come to fruition in this way. Um, so just a reminder, if you have any questions for Dr. Urban, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, we will start, we have one question. Um, so thank you very much for this insightful Belevertai journey. Uh, this is Prince from Nigeria, and he is wondering if there was any consideration in the pharmacodynamic activities among the Black population uh, during hepatitis B and Delta clinical trials. Yes, this is an important, um, uh, important question, and it, it raises also several different uh, aspects of that. First of all, what I wanted to tell you, which is, I think, very good in these real world studies in the French cohorts, there are many people from Africa that are now uh, participating and those are have a sub genotype of genotype one. And uh, there seems to be no problems in, in, in using uh, the, the bulliverthite here. Yeah? Um, uh, but during the early, uh, early studies, we have not done that. So we just have most of those were the, those uh, Caucasian patients that, that came from, but it seems to be that at least those that come from Algeria and so, uh, and having genotype, sub-genotype one are, uh, are, are responsive uh, to, to bulliverthite as well. I would like to use the, the, the opportunity to address the, an interesting question that you, that you have in, and that is, how is the efficacy towards different genotypes? As you know, we have eight different genotypes of, of uh, Delta. And although the peptide blocks entry of all genotypes, it could very well be that the efficacy of the drug is different in different genotypes. That depends, for example, on how aggressive for example, as a certain genotype is, genotype three, for example, whether the cell turnover would be higher because the, 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 the half-life time of the parasite would be shorter. So that could still be related. And we have to find that out in real world studies. And we hope, of course, that that, that can be answered soon. Thanks for the question. Excellent. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I actually have a couple of questions that came up. Um, so I know that uh, you mentioned that there, there is loss of RNA um, and uh, that, that has been shown for, for HCV. Does that have uh, any implications at all for loss of CCC DNA in hepatitis B or um, would there be any possibility for, uh, for carryover of, of DNA loss from, from what you found? So I hope I get the question right. So you want to ask whether what would happen if we would use bulliverthite for HPV only. So the the question for CC, yes, of course. The the um, our initial pilot trial was done in HPV mono infected patients. Yeah, and we were going for uh, and we see an effect. We the interesting thing. This is unpublished data has been presented at one of the meetings. We see that we have ALT normalization as well, similar to uh, Delta. And we see, let's say moderate one lock declines within half a year of treatment. So this is a, a clear effect that we can see for hepatitis B. And yes, we think so that, the, that it is slower. It's not as pronounced as in the HDV, but we may have and unfortunately, we couldn't measure directly the CCC DNA because we didn't have access to any of the uh, biopsy material here. There was no biopsies 
done in that trial, but it may well be that the turnover of CCC DNA by an entry inhibitor is also done. And uh, yes, you're right, because we, we, with your remark that we have much more RNA in the cell that we obviously get rid of during the treatment, then we have CCC DNA. And we even have the effect that the CCC DNA cannot survive cell division. So actually, uh, I think that bulliverotide may play a very important role in combination in the future, in combination therapies with the hepatitis B virus uh, uh, infect itself in com combination with immune modulators that lead to eradication or uh, of the uh, of infected hepatocytes, because then we prevent the reformation of CCC DNA during a uh, during that therapy, and that would be helpful for cura curation. Uh, curation of CCC DNA, which would not mean automatically loss of S antigen, because S antigen may be uh, provided by integrates from hepatitis B virus, and those cells may not even carry at all any CCC DNA anymore. We will see whether that helps. We have to also get rid of integrates if you want to have really the, the uh, full curative effect with S antigen loss and maybe zero conversion. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, that sounds quite promising. Um, so next question, um, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, oh, this was a little bit already answered. Is bulevertide effective against HBV infection prevention? Um, and yeah, I think, I think we actually, uh, touched on that a little bit. So I think there's, um, uh, definitely some hope for that coming forward. Um, we have a question from John Taylor. Um, thank you, Stefan. So uh, as the treatment works after a long time, um, there must be help from HDV infected cell death, uh, which cells die and why? And if these cells are also HBV infected and HDV has spread, um, would, should it not also HBV levels go down as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks, John. John, nice to, to have you here and ask these many questions, So, which of course could already. I mean, um, yes, uh, first of all, I think there is cytopathic effects of Delta. There is maybe additional effects of the immune uh, uh, system. Um, I'm still not convinced that the immune system is doing a lot, or the adaptive immune system, because, I mean, we normalize ALT levels and still the effect uh, in, uh, goes, goes on. That means that most of the uh, most of the uh, of, of the uh, the loss of cells comes maybe even without an active immune system. Yeah. Um, um, actually, with with regards to the co-infection, what 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 comes out more and more, and what I think is that the the major replication space that Delta uses is not at least in, the, in, in those patients that are ENG negative and have the infection for quite some time, is not a cell that has CCC DNA. Um, so it's a cell that expresses an uh, S antigen from the integrate. I guess this is even maybe exclusive, uh, ex, uh, ex, excluding itself that CCC DNA and Delta is there in a chronically infected patient. I could imagine that uh, if you eradicate, just as a theoretical thought, if you eradicate CCC DNA, you will not see a huge effect on Delta replication in a patient. That would be a hypothesis, of course, that has to be proven. The replication space, probably those cells that have an integrate. And if you want to get rid of those, you have to, uh, to, 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 yeah, you have to kill them by, by an immune modulator. Perfect. And HPV uh, level should go down, yes. And we see that in the, we, we see HPV DNA level going down and we also would expect RNA levels to go down uh, in, uh, in, in mono-infected patients. It has not been published, but, and it was only 15 patients. This is not, about not many patients. We should do a, a trial layer there. This is very important, do a trial there. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so next question, um, so great talk. Do you see a need or potential benefit to pairing the host targeting hepcludex with a direct acting antiviral targeting viral RNA? This is mm -hmm. from Brian Johnston. 
that is a that is a possibility. Um, uh, for example, we have done some uh, SI RNA approaches, but you need to do SI RNA. It's not not an easy approach for Delta. I think th the most efficient effect that you that you will have in synergism of heterodex would be to prevent. I didn't mention that very much to prevent the cell to cell mediated spread. Delta can spread even if you do not have S antigen. Yeah, if you infect the cell without S antigen, you replicate delta in the cell. If this cell may divide or divides, so the, the, the RNA can go to the, to, the, to the daughter cell. And if you prevent that spread, and you can prevent that with interferon, that's by the way what we think is the major effect of interferons, um, then you will have synergism. And we see that in the 203 trial. If you look in, the, uh, in, in, in some old studies, I didn't mention that here, the synergism with, with uh, interferon, then you have the most effect against the RNA because uh, uh, the innate immune system would recognize the RNA and their very potent endogenous mechanism to get rid of the RNA in an interferon induced state during cell division. So I wouldn't do it with the. I would do it in this indirect way and not not in the uh, in the way that you target the RNA directly. But one can do that. As, could do that as well. Yeah. That's, yeah, the combination therapy um, is is crucial for sure. Um, so then, Dr. Dusselin asks. Um, this is a little bit. Uh, we touched on this a little bit, but any uh, plans for HBV mono infection um, in in combination with nukes um, or other targets mm -hmm. um, and clinical trials in Africa yeah. as well, which you, I think you touched on a little bit. Yeah, maybe maybe to uh, to to address that. Yes, I mean first of all, uh, the drug is now under development in, in Gilead, and uh, uh, I hope they will follow, of course, the potential of the drug to uh, uh, in HPV mono infection um, as a mono. Therapy, as I already said, it would do something, but it would not clear S antigen. That's very clear. Uh, HDV mono, uh, bulimotide mono infection has no effect on, on S antigen uh, if it's uh, not given in a combination with an immune modulator. We saw in uh, one of the trials, the 203 trial, uh, two milligram um, bulimotide with interferon. Uh, um, some patients, so about 30% of patients that have S antigen responses. So something's happening here with respect to uh, uh, immune reactivation, and that should be really looked at in, uh, uh, in HPV mono infection. And that is some trial that has to be done in order to cure. I don't think it makes much of a no, it, we haven't seen any of a synergism. So the best synergism is not a nuke per se, but one can think also of other uh, combinations where an entry inhibitor could be beneficial uh, for CCC DNA elimination. But I think the immune modulator, that would be the, the thing. Also, maybe not the interferon, but the TLR agonists that are developed. This would be interesting. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it sounds like there's um, a great deal of interest in the potential for HBV, and it sounds like there's many areas still to explore. So that's great. Um, and then we have one more question. Um, so thank you, Dr. Orban. Uh, I'm 42 years old and an active man who um, otherwise doesn't have any symptoms, but I've been diagnosed with hepatitis B since age six and hepatitis D since 2012 and have advanced complicated cirrhosis. I'm on tenofovir for the last eight years. And I'm wondering, uh, yes, if bulevertide could be commercially available in Canada. So this speaks to um, the widespread availability of, of the drug and the process for that. Um, yes. First of all, I have to mention I'm not a I'm not a clinician. Yeah, but I hope yeah that of course the approval in Canada will be also soon, and I, I guess uh, that that would be very helpful for you. Yeah, uh, to to get access to that drug in the near future. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a um, it's a process involving many players, including companies, governments, and a variety of stakeholders. So it's slower than we'd like often. Um, and then we have a follow-up question from John. Um, so would you agree that HBV and the dependent HDV are on the edge of, of extinction? Um, and just your thoughts on, um, on elimination and, um, and the number of people needed to shape one infectious particle or particles needed, sorry. 
Uh, thanks, John, for that question. Um, I don't know exactly what you mean with extinction. I think extinction in a in a uh, in a patient, if you have a a, 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 a a certain level reach. Actually, I'm very skeptical on whether we could with the mono to, to be open. Yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical that in the case of this mono infection, we can really cure. The delta it's very efficient i mean you've done the, the major work on, on on that part it's very efficient once it has uh, 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 established an infection you can infect with the uh, chimpanzee uh, that that uh, that was hpv positive with very very low amounts so it's maybe a matter of time until that virus may come up again and uh, of course yes we can it, it could be that we are not able to eliminate that from a patient in the absence of a really active NTS immune response. Yeah, so, so the control of S antigen by the immune system, that could be the case. And then, of course, then we may end up with the kind of, uh, yeah, um, yeah, permanent therapy that we have to give under certain conditions, maybe reducing the doses, having a kind of, uh, one can change a little bit the, 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 the drug formulation, yeah, in a way that you have kind of slow release dosing with once a month uh, uh, injection of a bolus and something like that yeah but but that may be uh, maybe some 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 alternative but that's the reason that's the way we are doing this phase 3 trial and of course 5 years phase 3 trial is something uh, yeah that we will see in some years now in 3 or 4 years at the, the end whether we really we really can cure delta on the basis of S antigen positivity, or whether we need to cure B in the sense that we eliminate S antigen and have an anti-S anti, uh, status, anti-S antibody status. Wonderful. Um, so lots of areas for, um, for future, lots of unanswered questions, but moving in really positive directions. So um, great. And then we just have a couple of minutes yet, but I just wondered if you um, wanted to speak to, to a little bit to the work you're doing in diagnostics as well, and the need to um, to just uh, for point of care testing and your thoughts on how to identify more people living with with hepatitis alpha. Um, it Sorry, I didn't. I didn't get the, the oh, question. Do you want I'm me sorry. to comment on? Well, yeah, just the work you're doing in the diagnostic ah, space, and okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one one of the things that that our lab is also doing is uh, um, that was a development from Florian Lab in my in my lab. So we have uh, um, developed a point of care lateral flow assay for Delta testing of antibodies. So the idea was to that we have a pan genotypic testing device. Um, that allows us to, uh, even from a drop of blood, identify delta antibodies of any genotype in patient serum or in patient's blood. And that is now, of course, uh, still in the experimental phase. We have two publications. If you want to read that, just look at that, uh, where we had done some work in China, where some PhD student went to China and we have tested more than two and a half thousand samples there finding Delta in some regions in China, for example, in Inner Mongolia, um, but not very pronounced in, or not at all, in, in, in big cities like, China, like, like Shanghai or other cities. So as regional differences, we will uh, also hopefully develop that to a point where it becomes certified and is available. We are intending, of course, also to uh, make collaborations with several sites. We have collaboration with the sites in Africa, with the Pacific Island, with some other uh, people that are looking for these patients to get some first ideas on uh, how the epidemiology is there, and uh, then hopefully can get that point of care test also CE approved and approved for uh, uh, for further studies. This is, I mean, it's not available yet, but we hope, hope that we can discuss that maybe in two years and then we have the, 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 the thing there because we think it's very important to, to, to make diagnostic for Delta and also diagnostic um, that is fast and, and not doesn't uh, require uh, as a first round. I mean, you have to verify anyway the Delta RNA later on if, if you come to, to possible treatment, but to get better uh, ideas on, on how the epidemiology is. 
Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for, for that great work as well. Um, so I think we have come to the conclusion. Fiona, would you mind just sharing the last uh, slide, please? Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for your questions. Yeah, thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Urban, um, and thank you to everyone for participating in today's webinar. This has been um, a really great experience, uh, and we hope that you found it informative and valuable to your work and your life, and you can apply this information in some way moving forward. Um, hopefully, it's offered hope for the future of hepatitis delta and B. And we encourage you to complete the evaluation form after the webinar concludes. And just a reminder that a recording of this webinar and slide presentation will be emailed out to all attendees following the webinar. We also encourage you to sign up for our hepatitis delta newsletters for both providers and those who are living with hepatitis delta. Um, these are just a good way to be, to be added to our mailing list so you can receive regular updates about hepatitis delta drug developments, clinical trials, research, news, and events like this one. Um, so I will put uh, those those links to sign up will be emailed out with the recording as well. Um, and then we encourage you to please feel free to reach out and get in touch with us using the contact information on the slide. Um, and you can visit our Hep Delta Connect website for any more information. Um, feel free to send us any questions you may have. And uh, thank you so much again for joining. And thank you to Dr. Urban for this great presentation. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you also from my side. Have a nice day too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.